Going to the washing, guys.
to go for you guys, but when we actually wrote this episode, we had just come back home from it. As many of you probably know, GTC, or the Game Developers Conference, is probably the biggest industry-facing conference of the year. This is where the whole game industry gets together to talk shop and figure out how to best approach the year to come. So this week, I thought we'd talk about one of the major themes at GTC this year. One million ways. Our industry, metrics. Nice. This year, everyone seemed to be talking about metrics and finally taking a scientific approach to AAA games. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term, metrics, also known as telemetry, both coming from the same Greek word metron, meaning to better, are simply the tools we use to measure player behavior. Most games these days can be hooked in the code and send data back to the game developer whenever the player performs specific actions. It can be as simple an action as pressing the start button, or as complex as completing a specific quest with specific gear on a specific deck. Often, we can measure how long yeah, sure. you like and where you went. Uh, for microtransaction games, we can measure when you buy and track the action you right before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can track what teams are popular. In first-person shooters, any good shooter studio can tell you exactly how many people have been killed online with any weapon at any given time, and then give you how that weapon compares to the other weapons in kill region. I can go on, but you get the idea. Basically, today, if you're connected to a server, any developer worth their salt can learn something about the way you play if they care for the time anyway. We're getting better at thinking about what we want to measure from the outset when developing games. And we're improving our tools for examining and relating this data, which means that designers can now look at real player data on a massive scale, rather than just conjecturing in an office about what the players might be doing. Now, in many ways, this is great. It lets developers tweak and improve their games long after launch. It's led to the culture of passion and updating games to increase their life cycle. It's allowed us to really dig into what features resonate most with the player base, so we can focus on them when constructing sequels. With that said, sitting there this year, listening to everybody talk about others, we started to see a downside. A downside which I think could turn into a tragic mistake. Now this is a bit of a generalization, but many of you may know that social games are often metrics driven. This means that they simply launch a product at what they consider to be its minimum viable state, and then watch the numbers, polishing it according to what the great dreams of incoming data say. Many of you are also probably aware that this year, in terms of dollar for dollar profitability, the AAA industry got their asses. This left a lot of people, especially on the business wow. side of the AAA world, looking towards social games and saying, well, what did we do wrong? And the answer they seem to have latched onto is metrics-driven design. The problem with metrics is that they can only look backwards. You can only take data about something that already exists. You know how the world of social games is so permeated with clones and knockoffs? This is why. Even though social games are far, far cheaper to make than AAA titles, somehow there's almost a greater degree of stagnation in the social game world than in the big budget side of the industry. Why? Because you can't use metrics to innovate. There's no way of measuring the response to something that no one's made or experienced yet. Dear, Instead, clear. social games tend to find things that already work and then try to use player feedback to polish them until hopefully they outshine your I just cleared it just like a bad thing. Don't get wrong. wrong. As an industry-wide trend, but it's failed to do it. Video games have always been the marriage of art and science. And now we're looking to use metrics not to place them firmly as a science, but rather to relegate them to a manufactured good. Data is to code out. And once this culture gets established in a company, it's very hard to turn around. Say you're a designer, and you say, guys, awesome game idea, All right? A game where we give the player a gun that shoots two interconnected wormholes that let the player traverse space in interesting ways, with, like a funny psychotic computer antagonizing them the entire time. And then someone responds, all right, huh, you have the data to back that up? It's very hard to argue with that. Soon, everything's safe by the numbers, and your big company just has too many interlocking parts that depend on those numbers to disentangle your ideas from them. Now hopefully this will change, as even the large social games companies are coming to realize that while metrics are a fantastic tool for understanding your player base, metrics alone don't create fun long-lasting games. It's also important to remember that metrics are being used not only to shape games, but to guide advertising and home brand image as well. But like everything else, metrics are only as good as the people building them. Very often, games or brands have turned themselves into inaccessible niche products by listening only to the people currently using them or relying on a poorly constructed set of questions used to thread the data. Now don't get me wrong, metrics aren't bad. They're actually very useful. But they aren't the answer either. Not alone anymore. There's no silver bullet to how to make the AAA industry compete with all the emerging forms of games. And if we cling to some single nostrum as a cure-all as the answer to all the woes of the industry today, we're not going to get anywhere. Thanks for watching. See you next week.
early 1930s, a man named Berkus Frederick Skinner began to study psychology in a radical new way. See, before then, we only knew how to condition reactions. We could condition a person to be terrified of pumpkins or hungry at the sight of office supplies. But Skinner theorized that you could go on further. He theorized that you could con Every social game these days uses a system that limits how much you can play at a time. They all seem to either have everything you do consume energy from a bar okay. that goes up yeah. or it's simply put your actions on a timer. Huh? So let's talk about that business, because I started seeing it creep into other types of games. Now, you may hate these systems, and I'm kind of with you on that, but as they become more ubiquitous, one of the things that's bugged James the most is that they just keep getting used wrong. He keeps seeing games that implement these systems just because other popular games are doing it, without realizing why those systems were built in the first place. So today, we're going to go over what these systems are intended to do from a game design perspective, which I'm hoping will be useful information for designers and players both. Because more often than not, these systems are a lot like the skitter box stuff we talked about before. They're not about good design, they're psychological traits that take advantage of human nature. I figure the more you know about them, the better you can see through what they're doing and avoid the Hey, Thomas, how's it going, buddy? So these systems are built for three reasons. Did you finish it? Content yeah. restrictions and both also, by can I see it? And situation. Business has recognized long ago that if they can get you to make their yeah, store part of your daily yeah. routine, they're going to get a lot more money from you. They have to spend a lot less money. Ooh, you know those buy ten get one free cards they give you at your local coffee shops? Those aren't just an attempt to lure you in with a functional nine percent discount. They're actually an attempt to get you to keep coming back until they'll go into the store with your routine. And that's exactly what these energy systems. Yeah, are. do a shoot right now. Get in the habit of Out of bounds. Just gonna shoot and save it up on your drive and tomorrow you can come and fix it. The rest of the area system in World of Warcraft is a habitual fine. It's powerful because one of the core drives for many people playing WoW is this strange human desire. In any MMO, you'll find a subset of players who are all about maximizing how efficiently they can play through the game. But in almost every human being you'll find, because of the clear mathematical efficiency, there's almost a compulsion to take the most of that path. Oh, don't worry about it. First render it. Uh, we'll okay. Isolate the back back in green though, and maybe like make it like a interesting like anime like background or something. Oh, okay. So they couldn't afford to have a player blaze through the whole thing once they tell it's hitting and then just everything up there again. Now, in total of these cases, file export timing system habituates the player to play a regular predictable schedule. Both of these systems are also designed to make the change the loose list setting and the optimal for the game, whether it be to fit their platform or to graduate the player toward a more hardcore play pattern. And both of these systems are also directly tied to the principal reward system. Devonte, you're done. Time to switch computer. Okay. Only have one more minute. Nope. Because they, they already start to trick attack. They mean said you're done, so you got to go on to the next one, man. In college, they would yeah. not let. When you go to college, they're not going to let you continue. So you have to practice that now, man. Oh, just call it the flash. Come on. Come on. Come on. Switch over. You got to push the pause button. Come on, dude. Come on. I'm trying to help you. No, 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 no. Just hit the pause button. Hit the pause button. Yes. Hit the pause. No, dude, just hit the pause button. And when just you're done pause saving, button. I press the render. Devonte, button. stop. Just hit the pause button. Come on. You can't play. No, you can't play, man. You can't why, why play. Can't play? You have to go to work. So, you have to hit the pause button. All right. All right. No. Seriously, you just turn the computer around. If I was in, dude, if this was college, they would just shut off your computer, or kick you out. So come on, we have to get in the habit. It's like at work, you know. You gotta go to work. Oh, come on. Sounds good. Save and then render, and then I gotta work with Fonte. All right. So go over there now. Okay, I'm already down in college. So. Uh, you're only done half. So you gotta sit down at that computer now, man. Come on. We gotta get.